Hello and welcome to BrainFacts.org and to the at-home activity portion of the Brain Awareness Week online webinar. The full webinar was part of Brain Awareness Week, an international event to celebrate neuroscience and the brain. Check out the other portions of the presentation to learn about human and animal brain anatomy and function. I am Casey Henley, the Online Programs Coordinator and Faculty Outreach Co-Coordinator for the Neuroscience Program at Michigan State University. So let's dive into three hands-on activities that allow us to see the brain in action. Can you think of a time that you've had to act quickly, almost without thinking? Maybe a friend tossed something your way when you weren't completely paying attention. Or maybe it's when you hit your alarm off as fast as possible this morning. Or perhaps you stopped the game-tying soccer goal or hit the game-winning fastball out of the park. All of these require lightning-fast reactions. And today, we are going to test how fast your reaction time is. I would like to point out that your reaction time is different from a reflex. Reflexes, like the patella reflex seen during the knee tap test at the doctor's office, are automatic, involuntary responses that involve the spinal cord, but not the brain. A reaction, however, is much more complex neurological pathway. It involves decision-making processes and therefore requires input from the brain. So let's try it at home. To prepare, you will need a ruler, or if you have younger participants, a yardstick works great. Something with which to jot down your results and at least one friend. So let's get testing. Have your friend hold the ruler near the top end and let it hang down with the zero inches mark at the bottom. Place your index finger and thumb at the bottom of the ruler, ready to grab the ruler when dropped. But don't touch the ruler. Once you are ready to catch the ruler, your friend should drop it. Once you see the ruler start to drop, catch it between your two fingers. Record the level, inches or centimeters, at which you caught the ruler. Test yourself three times. Your friend should vary when he or she drops the ruler. By waiting a few seconds, it makes it more difficult for you to guess when the ruler will drop. After three times, switch places. Once you have your distances written down, you can determine the actual time it took you to react to the falling ruler. This table is also included at the resources at the end of the webinar as well. So what is happening in your brain during this process? Well, your neurons are communicating. But really, what does that mean? Neurons are the basic units of the brain. They are specialized for sending electrical signals over long distances and are electrically and chemically excitable. The typical neuron consists of the cell body, dendrites, the axon, and presynaptic terminals. Dendrites are short processes that branch out in a tree-like fashion. They are the main target for incoming signals received from the axons of other cells. The number of inputs a neuron receives depends on the complexity of the dendritic branching. Unlike the branching characteristics of the dendrites, the axon is usually a long, single process and begins at the cell body at the axon hillock. The axon might travel a very short distance, for example, a few hundred micrometers as an interneuron between two other neurons or it can travel a very long distance. For example, a meter, if it's a sensory neuron in your big toe and has to travel all the way up to your spinal cord. Axons can branch in order to communicate with more than one target cell. The axon transmits an electrical signal called an action potential from the axon hillock all the way to the presynaptic terminal where the electrical signal 
will result in a release of chemical neurotransmitters to communicate with the next cell. Many axons are also covered by a myelin sheath, which increases the speed of the action potential. The axon terminates at the presynaptic terminal or terminal bouton. These presynaptic terminals is where the neurotransmitter release occurs. The presynaptic terminal of the axon forms a synapse with another neuron, known as the postsynaptic cell. Most commonly, axons contact dendrites, but it is possible for axons to communicate with cell bodies or even other axons. Let's take a closer look at the synapse. When an action potential arrives in the presynaptic axon terminal, the neurotransmitter molecules are released from synaptic vesicles into the synaptic cleft. The postsynaptic region of a synapse contains receptors that are activated by the release of the neurotransmitter. The activation can cause the postsynaptic cell to initiate an action potential. So there is an electrical to chemical back to electrical signal transformation of information during neuronal communication. So in the reaction test, visual information of the ruler dropping reaches your eye. Your retina then sends this information to the visual cortex located in the occipital lobe in the back of your brain. This info then makes its way to the frontal lobe where the decision-making process occurs. You know you need to catch the ruler. The instructions then head to the motor cortex, where information is sent out to motor neurons that reside in the spinal cord, and then to your hand muscles to catch the ruler. All of that in less than a quarter of a second. That's pretty amazing. So now that you've completed the basic reaction time test, here are some alternative options you can do at home after the webinar. In the previous activity, you watched the ruler drop, and that is how you knew when to catch it. So instead, close your eyes. Then, when your friend drops the ruler, he or she should say the word drop, and then you catch the ruler. Or, your friend can tap your foot to indicate when you should catch it. So how does the reaction time change in these different scenarios? What happens when the sensory information comes in through your ears instead of your eyes? And what are the new pathways? You can also turn reaction time tests into a game. Compete with your friends or compare parents and kids scores. Or you can try to improve your times after practice. You can also try catching with your non-dominant hand and see how your time changes. And of course, you can always come up with your own ideas. So let's move on to our next at-home activity, examining touch and perception. We all know the five main senses, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. In actuality, there are more than just these five. Often thirst and hunger are considered senses, as is your sense of balance and proprioception, the ability to know where your body is in space. Our senses are how we interact with the environment. If you think about our nervous system in simplistic terms, there is an input, our senses, processing that occurs in the central nervous system, and an output, our behavior. Without sensory input, we would not know how to react to our world. For this activity, we are going to focus on the sense of touch. Touch can encompass a number of different sensations, pressure, vibration, itch, pain, temperature, and sometimes these are each considered their own sense. The way we are able to sense all of these different feelings is through the presence of special receptors in the skin. Each receptor is located in a specific layer of skin and each measures a specific type of tactile sensation. 
The receptors convert a mechanical signal, such as pressure and skin stretch, into electrical signals within the sensory neuron that travels to the spinal cord and then sends signals up to the brain. In the brain, the information is processed by the somatosensory cortex, shown here in pink. This sensory transduction is a common principle of all sensory systems. A stimulus, could be light or sound or touch, activates a specialized receptor, which in turn sends an electrical signal, the action potential, down the axon. After the receptor is activated, the process of signal transduction is like that which we saw earlier, electrical signal to chemical signal to electrical signal. In the brain, the somatosensory cortex has a somatotopic map of our body. If you feel something with your fingers, neurons in this area will become active. As you've probably experienced, some parts of your body are more sensitive than others. Sensitivity is dependent on the density of receptors present in an area of skin. The more receptors, the more sensitive the area. More receptors in the skin also leads to a larger area of the somatosensory cortex being dedicated to that region. For example, Look at how large the cortex area is for the fingers compared to the rest of the arm. How do you think other regions of the body compare in sensitivity? Well, to answer that question, we're gonna do another activity. For this activity, you will need a paper clip, a ruler, some paper, and a pen or pencil, and your friend. One way to determine sensitivity of an area of skin is to test its two-point discrimination. So first, straighten out and then bend your paper clip into a U. Put the arms close together. Then close your eyes and have your friend touch the paper clip gently to your arm. Tell your friend if you can feel one point or two. If only one point is felt, your friend should pull the arms of the paper clip apart a little. Again, state if you can feel one or two distinct points. Your friend should keep pulling the arms of the paper clip apart until you are able to feel two separate points. Once you feel two points, measure the distance between the paper clip arms and record it. Test multiple spots on your body, your fingertips, the back of your hand, your arm, your lips, your back, your leg, and your foot. After you complete all of the regions, test each one more time. Then compare the different regions. Which areas had the smallest distance between the two points? Why do you think this is? After the webinar, try some of these alternative activities. Cool the areas of skin with an ice cube before testing the two-point discrimination. Or see who is more sensitive, parents or kids or boys or girls. And finally, create your own homunculus. A homunculus is a 3D representation of the somatotopic map in the brain. You can create your own homunculus at home. Simply take your two-point discrimination results and use this equation, five times one over your result in centimeters. This will give you your size for that body part in your homunculus. For example, if your threshold for your fingertips was three millimeters or 0 0.3 centimeters, then five times one over 0 0.3 is 16.67. So you should make your fingers about 16 centimeters in length. Do this for all of your two point discrimination results and you will have your own funny homunculus to show off. And now on to our final activity. By now we all know how cool and important the brain is. Taking care of our brain is really important. If it gets injured, the brain doesn't heal like other parts of the body so protecting it from damage is critical. 
Let's do an activity where we can learn about the brain's natural protection. To follow along with our demonstration, you will need one or preferably two jars. The 16 ounce glass mason jars work really well. A couple of eggs and some water. This demonstration can get a little messy, so make sure you check with your parent or guardian before starting. Our body provides some protection for the brain. Our strong skull protects external objects from being able to come into contact with our soft brain tissue. Poke your head and your brain is totally safe. Do you think the skull is our only form of protection for the brain? Let's set up a demonstration to see. Get one of your jars and an egg. The jar is going to represent our skull and the egg our brain. Put the egg inside of the mason jar and screw on the lid tightly. Like our brain and our skull, the egg is safe from external objects. Now shake it up. Oh no, what a mess! Although the egg is safe from external objects, it's still not safe inside the jar. This is the same situation for our brain. Your brain isn't just hanging out inside your skull. Just imagine if the skull was the only protection. What would happen if you shook your head all around? You'd have a scrambled brain. Of course, we know that's not what happens in real life. Our brain has more protection inside our skulls with the presence of cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. Let's take a look at how this fluid helps protect our brain. Get a clean jar, or clean the messy one, and a new egg. Again, jar is our skull, egg is our brain. Put the egg in the jar, but this time, fill up the jar with water. This water is going to represent our CSF. Make sure the lid is on and shake up the egg. Did you notice a difference? The egg should be totally fine, or at least not as smashed as the egg with no water. The water protected the egg, just like our CSF protects our brain. Way to go, CSF. Now, CSF is great, and it does a wonderful job protecting our brain in normal, everyday situations. But sometimes we need to provide our brain with more protection. When riding bikes, skateboarding, playing sports, or participating in other similar activities, it is important to wear a helmet to prevent brain injury. Additionally, seat belts should always be worn in the car. A hard fall or forceful hit to the head can cause serious damage. Traumatic brain injuries are responsible for almost half a million visits to the emergency room annually for children under the age of 15. So keep that brain safe. If you want to keep making a mess after the webinar, you can make a helmet for your egg. See how extra protection can keep the egg intact. Definitely get permission before attempting this at home. Use materials you can find around the house like tape, bubble wrap, paper, styrofoam, etc. to protect your egg from a fall. After the egg is all bundled up, drop it to see if it breaks. It's best to drop the egg into a box or newspaper and you can place the egg in a sandwich bag prior to putting on its helmet to contain the mess as much as possible. Thank you for watching the at-home activity portion of our Brain Awareness Week online webinar.